الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراج منيرا First and foremost again I just want to take a moment out to thank the administration of the masjid May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them immensely Masjid al-Furqan indeed is one of those masajid that brings the four corners of Manchester together Just now Staz Ubaidah he was telling me, subhanAllah, how many nationalities can we see sitting here? You know, very multicultural. So it's really, really magnificent to see how the masjid is bringing together all of these different nationalities as we are all from the children of Adam. Today you find masajid, Somali masjid, Pakistani masjid, Indian masjid. We need masajid that bring everyone together, right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them immensely. The second point that I want to make, my brothers and my sisters, the Sheikh, when he contacted me, he wanted me to go through a small treatise, or like a metan, a text, for this period between Asr and Maghrib. To be fair and honest, right, Sheikh had a point to go through text, because you know, we have to try and balance it out between lectures and likewise lessons. The reason I'm mentioning this is because there is a very important point I want to make. When it comes to our deen, brothers and sisters, right, with lectures, what does it do? It increases your iman. It's an iman booster. People always say, oh, that was a wonderful lecture. My iman went up. How do we keep our iman afloat, our faith afloat? By learning more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Right? our only source of information that we have with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through his names and his attributes, right? The more you learn about Allah azza wa jal, the more fearful you become of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you are in awe of him, right? The more conscious you will be of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what you normally find in the texts that are studied. However, my brothers and my sisters, I told the Shaykh that I want to go through a passage from the Quran, which has also been incorporated into a hadith that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam related the story of Musa والسلام, when he engaged and interacted with Khadr والسلام, right? And of course, there is nothing more greater than going through the book of Allah Jalla Fi Ula. And going through text is not the only way of gaining that consciousness of Allah Jalla Fi Ula. An individual may think that you have to only go through books and to completely overlook the lectures. No, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give reminders on Thursdays. He also used to give khutbas, Friday sermons, right? <coughs> and he used to explain the Quran to his companions, right? So there are different ways of learning about our religion. And this is something that needs to be emphasized. Right? Whether it is done by way of a text, whether it is done by explaining a hadith, whether it is done by doing tafsir of the Quran. Sometimes we hear that someone may be explaining the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is chaotic da'wah. Just because he has chosen not to go through a particular text. Right? And this is of course wrong as well. There has to be a balance. There has to be a balance. In the time of the companions, they didn't have like text, but the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would explain the Quran to them. Right? So even though the Shaykh wanted me to go through a text, right, that goes up all the way to Maghrib, he said, I'm going to make sure that I rinse every right ounce of or every inch of energy out of you now that you're coming to Manchester. But alhamdulillah, I chose to go through this hadith, which is a little bit long, which we're going to go through bi Ta'ala. And then we're going to extrapolate 15 benefits, bi-idhnillah al-bari, right? In this time that we have. Last week, I did the same, but I only had enough time to go through 10 when I went to Derby. Hopefully today, bi-idhnillah ta'ala, it will be a lot more explanatory, a lot more detailed. And bi-idhnillah ta'ala, relatable, that which we can take away and apply almost instantly in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Imam al-Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, 
he brings this interaction or this engagement that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam had with Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam in a hadith that he narrated. And he chaptered it as Bab ma yustahabbu lil alim idha su'il ayyu nasi a'lam an yakhila al-ilma ilallahi azza wa jal. Right. Look at the way he chaptered it. That which is required from a scholar when he is asked who the most knowledgeable person is that he credits this knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This whole qissa, the way it started, my brothers and my sisters, as we will come to know in a moment, Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, as the hadith goes, right, Ubay ibn Ka'b, he says that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once narrated that Musa alayhi salatu wa salam qama khatiban fi bani Israel, he once stood up and he began to deliver a sermon. As he was delivering this sermon, فَسُئِلْ أَيُّ النَّاسِ يَعْلَمْ He was asked, who is the most knowledgeable person? Right? His response was, فَقَالْ أَنَا أَعْلَمْ I am the most knowledgeable person. فَعَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ إِذْ لَمْ يَرُدَّ الْعِلْمَ إِلَيْهِ Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to admonish him. Decided to discipline Musa alayhi salatu wa salam simply because he did not credit this knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? As Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Above every individual who possesses knowledge, there is someone who is more knowledgeable than him. And above everyone is Al-Alim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is most knowledgeable of everything. And that keeps you, my brothers and my sisters, grounded. Keeps your feet on the ground, humbled. The moment you begin to think that you are something, my brothers and my sisters, you are, right, taking a very dark journey to destruction, right? We are nothing, my brothers and my sisters, right? If you want to know what kind of individual you are, my brothers and my sisters, or on the face of this earth, what you actually equate to, maybe go up the 15th floor. I live on the 15th floor, in a building that's maybe what, 17 floors? Go up to maybe the 15th or the 16th floor and then look down. You will see what little dots walking around who are human beings. That tiny, right? This is what we are. I even heard, subhanAllah, one of the great pious men of the past one time mention, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ يَتَكَبَّرْ Right? عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ يَتَكَبَّرْ It amazes me how one can be arrogant. وَقَدْ خَرَجَ مِنْ مَخْرَجِ الْبَوْلِ مَرَّتَيْنِ And he came out of two private parts. But then he's walking on the face of this earth, on the face of this earth so haughty, so arrogant, so proud. What is he referring to? He came out of his dad's private part and then his mother gave birth to him. So he came out of two private parts and then he walks around being extremely arrogant. Right? So here, and by the way, I'm not saying that Musa alayhi salatu was some arrogant, huh? just in case someone wants to clip this out and put it on TikTok, right? TikTok is a muskila, brothers. I'm not even on TikTok. They're always clipping videos out, making these, a'udhu billah, anyways. إِذْ لَمْ يَرُدُّ الْعِلْمَ إِلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonished him, decided to discipline him for not crediting the knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَوْحَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِي بِمَجْمَعِ الْبَحْرِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, inspired him now to go and visit a servant from amongst his many servants that is at the conjunction of where the two seas meet. Right? So Musa alayhi salatu wa salam being so eager, even though, remember brothers and sisters, he is a prophet from the prophets of Allah and not just any random prophet. From the five greatest prophets, right? He asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Allah Azza told him, He is more knowledgeable than you go to him. Oh Allah, how do I get to him? احمل حوتا في مكتل فإذا فقدته فهو ثم الله سبحانه وتعالى revealed to him take a bucket that has a fish inside of it and when you lose this fish 
Where you lose this fish is where Khadr alayhi salatu wassalam is going to be. Right. فانطلق وانطلق بفتات أو بفتاه يوشع بن نون So he set out on his journey and he took along with him his servant called يوشع بن نون Right. وحمل حوتا في مكتل So they took this fish with them حتى كان عند الصخرة up until they reached this Sakhra, this rock. And they decided now to sleep on this rock. They've been traveling. And as they were asleep, Right? This fish jumped out of this bucket that they were carrying and he slipped into the sea. Right, سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ سَرَبًا And this is mentioned in the Quran, Surah Al-Kahf that we read every Friday. Have we read Surah Al-Kahf today, guys? Right. So it made its way into the sea. وَكَانَ لِمُوسَى وَفَتَاهُ عَجَبًا فَانْطَلَقَ بَقِيَّةَ لَيْلَتِهِمَا وَيَوْمِهِمَا فَلَمَّا أَصْبَحَ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ آتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا لَقَدْ لَقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبًا so they continued traveling through the night and then through the day. As around, you know, noontime kicked in, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he says to his servant, right, Atina ghada'ana, bring us the lunch. Laqad laqina min safarina hadha nasaba. Indeed, we have begun to experience, right, much fatigue through all of this traveling that we have been doing. وَلَمْ يَجِدْ مُوسَى مَسًّا مِنَ النَّصَبِ حَتَّى جَاوَزَ الْمَكَانِ الَّذِي أُمِرَ بِهِ The عجيب thing in all of this was that Musa, even though they were traveling for so long, he didn't begin to feel any tiredness up until this point. Right? Up until this point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to alert him that he has maybe gone past where he was destined to go to, right? Or where he was on his way to go to. So after that, subhanAllah, فَقَالَ لَهُ فَتَاهُ أَرَأَيْتَ إِذَا وَيْنَا إِلَى السَّخْرَةِ فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ Do you remember Musa when we stopped at that rock and we slept? I forgot that hoot, that fish that we were carrying at that point, right? قَالَ مُوسَى ذَلِكَ مَا كُنَّا نَبْغِي this is what we've been seeking all of this time. Allah Azza wa revealed to him that he should take this fish and the moment he loses this fish, that's where, Mu that's where Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam is going to be, right? But they didn't pay attention. After waking up, they continued traveling. So Musa is saying, that's where we're meant to be. That was our destination. So they went back. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us, فَارْتَدَّ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمَا قَصَصًا so they went retracting their footsteps, right? فَلَمَّا انْتَهَيَا إِلَى السَّخَرَةِ إِذَا رَجُلٌ مُسَجَّى مُسَجَّنْ بِثَوْبٍ أَوْ قَالَ تَسَجَّى بِثَوْبِهِ When they came back to that place that they had forgotten that fish at, they saw this man standing there that was covered in his garment. Right? تَسَجَّى بِثَوْبِهِ فَسَلَّمَ مُوسَى فَقَالَ الْخَضِرُ وَأَنَّا بِعَرْدِكَ السَّلَامِ Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam greeted Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and then he said to him, how do you guys give each other salams from where you're from? How do you guys greet each other? Right? فَقَالَ أَنَا مُوسَى So he told him, I am Musa. فَقَالَ مُوسَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ قَالَ نَعَمْ So he asked him, is this Musa from Bani Israel? He said, yes. Right? قَالَ هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتُ رُشْتَىٰ So right away, Musa alayhi salatu was salam was to get down to business, right? He says to him, هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ Is it possible for me to accompany you so that you may teach me something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you? Khadir alayhi salatu was salam responds and says, قَالَ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِي صَبْرًا you will not be able to be patient. 
Right? You're not going to be able to be patient with me. Right? You want to accompany me, right? But I don't think you're going to be patient. Ya Musa, inni ala ilmin min ilmi lahi. Allamanihi la ta'lamuhu ant wa anta ala ilmin allamakahu la alamuhu. Right? Khadir alayhi salatu wa sallam tells him, O Musa, indeed Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed me with knowledge that you don't possess. And Allah Azza wa Jal has taught you that which I don't have or that which I am not aware of. Right? Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam responds and he says, قَالَ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ صَابِرًا وَلَا أَعْصِي لَكَ أَمْرًا Insha'Allah Ta'ala, you're going to find me patient. Don't worry, right? And I'm not going to disobey you in anything. Anything that you ask me to do, you will not see me going against your orders and your commandments. I will be patient. Right? Satajiduni insha'Allah sabira. Even though it is not mentioned in the hadith. Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us in His Quran, وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرَ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِطْ بِهِ خُبْرًا How can you be patient about something that you don't have any knowledge of? One of the benefits that we're going to be taking, inshaAllah ta'ala, when we go through the 15 benefits is, that which helps with patience, it's a coping mechanism, is to have an idea of what you are getting yourself involved in prior to starting that journey. It could be investments, it could be marriage. How many people do we see pulling out of marriages? They want to jump ship, the grass is green on the other side. This is not what I signed up for. We're going to come on to that. And that is because, I see a lot of people smiling, huh? I think they feel like that. Allahu Alam. Right? It helps to educate yourself prior to what you are about to start doing. Right? To prepare yourself mentally and physically. Right? To what you are about to embark on. We're going to come on to that, inshaAllah ta'ala. فَانْطَلَقَ يَمْشِيَانِ عَلَى سَاحِلِ الْبَحَرِ لَيْسَ لَهُ مَا سَفِينَةِ So him and Khadir alayhi salatu was salam, they began to walk together on the seashore, on the coast, right? They didn't have a safina, they didn't have a ship with them. As they were walking, فَمَرَّتْ بِهِمَا سَفِينَةٌ فَكَلَّمُوهُمْ أَنْ يَحْمِلُوهُمَا فَعُرِفَ الْخَضِرِ فَحَمَلُوهُمَا بِغَيْرِ نَوْلٍ As they were walking, brothers and sisters, a ship came close and they recognized Khadir alayhi salatu was salam. So they offered to let them board the ship without charging them. بِغَيْرِ نَوْلٍ Right? So they got on the ship, they boarded. As they were there, standing on the ship, Musa alayhi salatu was salam and Khadir, a usfur, fajaa usfurun, fawaka ala harf is safina. This usfur, this bird came and it began to sit on the side of the ship and it began to peck on the water. Can you guys imagine a bird now pecking into the water as they do, right? You'll see them floating on the water and they start pecking in order to quench their thirst, right? Fanakara nakratan o nakrataini fil bahar. So he did that once or twice, as the hadith mentions. فقال الخضر يا موسى خضر ست موسى عليه الصلاة والسلام أو موسى ما نقص علمي وعلمك من علم الله إلا كنقرة هذا العصفور في البحر. You know when this bird starts pecking onto the sea, does it reduce from the sea that is pecking from? Not really, right? Allah سبحانه وتعالى sent موسى تخضر in order to benefit from him. خضر عليه الصلاة والسلام is telling him that. You know how much of the sea has been reduced by the pecking of this bird? No matter how knowledgeable we are, the knowledge that I possess and the knowledge that you possess doesn't take anything away from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same way the pecking of this bird doesn't take anything away from the sea. Right? Ilmullahi azza wa jalla. How many a time, my brothers and my sisters, we ask ourselves, why is this happening to me? This shouldn't be happening to me. Right? Our knowledge is very, very limited. We don't understand why it's maybe happening for us in this way. We think that it's always bad for us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ya'lamu. Wallahu ya'lamu antum. La ta'lamun. Wa'asa an takrahu shay'an wa yaj'al Allahu fihi khayran kathira. There is stuff that Allah knows that we don't know of, brothers and sisters. We just have to let Allah azza wa jal execute his plan. 
Oh, we're going to come into all of this, inshallah ta'ala. I'm getting a little bit too excited, you know. It's coming out from time to time. Tayyip. فَعَمَدَ الْخَضِرُ إِلَىٰ لَوْحٍ مِنْ أَلْوَاحِ السَّفِينَةِ فَلَزَعَهِ Right? So just out of the blue, Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam took a couple of steps forward and he decided to pull out a plank of wood from this ship that they were on. I imagine yourself now, you've boarded a ship and you start getting a hammer and you start digging through the ship. Would anyone in their right mind do that? But this is exactly what Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam started to do, right? So Musa alayhi salatu wasalam becomes shocked at what he's doing. And he says to him, right? قَوْمٌ حَمَلُونَ بِغَيْرِ نَوْلِ عَمَدْتَ إِلَىٰ سَفِينَتِهِمْ فَخَرَقْتَهَا لِتُغْرِقَ أَهْلَهَا Right? They let you both for free. They didn't take a charge. Right? They didn't take any money off you. And then you decided to put a hole inside of the ship. What are you doing? Right? Musa alayhi salatu wa salam says to him, Sorry, Khadr alayhi salatu wa salam says to him, أَلَمْ أَقُلْ إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِي سَبْرَ then I say to you that you are not going to be able to be patient. Right? Musa alayhi salatu wa salam said, لا تؤخذني بما نسيت Don't hold me to account for that which I done out of forgetfulness. For those who read Surah Al-Kahf regularly or those who have memorized Surah Al-Kahf, right? as I'm going through this hadith, there are parts that come to mind, right? Some of these parts of the hadith, my brothers and my sisters, right, are Quranic ayat. The verses have been incorporated into what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was explaining. When we look at the Quran and its tafsir, my brothers and my sisters, the way the tafsir of the Quran is done, tafsir al Qurani bil Quran. There are steps. I can't just start thinking, oh, this is what I think, or this is what I thought today. Right? Let me start uttering about the Quran what I think. No, it doesn't work like that. Right? There are steps that the ulama mention in their books of usul al-tafsir. The first step is tafsir al-Qur'an in quran explaining the Qur'an with the Qur'an. There are parts of the Qur'an that are maybe, let's just say in Surah Al-Baqarah, that explain that which is at the end of the Qur'an. Right? And then the second step is tafsir al-Qur'an in sunnah where the Qur'an is explained by way of hadith, by way of the sunnah. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِنَاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ You can't think that I'm going to separate the Qur'an from the hadith. No, they go hand in hand with one another. That's why if you don't know hadith, it's going to be very, very hard now to explain or to try and understand the Qur'an. They go hand in hand with one another. Right? The Qur'an was coming down upon the Prophet ﷺ, and then he would explain it to his companions. And then you have what? Explaining the Qur'an with the statements of the companions. Right? And then tafsir al-Qur'an, explaining the Qur'an with the tafsir of the tabi'i, as they took the Qur'an directly from the companions. And then you have the Arabic language as well. So there are usul that are what followed. It's not what I think or what Abu Taymiyyah thinks or what my Mawli Sahib or my Sheikh told me about. This is what he means. Okay, I need to ask him, where did he get this understanding from? When you look at a lot of these liberals, they'll just come to the Qur'an and they'll start explaining the Qur'an however they want. It doesn't work like that. I was watching this, I don't want to say the name because I don't want you guys to get exposed to it, right? Where they sat down conservative Muslims and liberal Muslims. The video went absolutely viral, it was on YouTube. Liberal Muslims, put your hand up if you saw it. MashaAllah, you guys on YouTube. <laughs> you had conservative Muslims, they had liberal Muslims. They would ask them questions such as, is the hijab mandatory? So you had a liberal think she was what? She was a, uh, was she homosexual? Huh? Homosexual, right? Because we have to be careful. She might be transgender and I'm, you know, and I need to, you know, uh, be careful with the pronouns. And So anyways, she's wearing a hijab as well, but she identifies as homosexual, right? And then she goes, no, the Quran doesn't say that the hijab is mandatory. Based on who's understanding her understanding. And then she goes, when I went through the tafsir of the Quran, she started reading the Quran in English, it just said, you should wear the hijab. She has no knowledge of usul al-fiqh, no knowledge of hadith, no knowledge even the Quran. But she saw a very, <coughs> how can I put this right? 
a translation of the Quran, because the translation never gives the Quran its true, true justice. Right? It never gives its true justice. In the Arabic language, certain types of wordings and phrases, what it does, it tells you because of this phrase now, or because the word has been maybe worded in this way, it shows Amr, that this is now mandatory, and sometimes it's Sunnah. There's a whole science that is studied. And you can only understand this if you know the Arabic language alongside Usul al-Fiqh, which are the tools that you need in order to understand the Quran. And this one I said to myself, ah, oh, this is why knowledge is so important. So important. May Allah Azza wa bless those two brothers. One of them was called Jad. And I forgot the other brother's name. Who really stood up for Islamic values and morals. And they held their ground. Taib. So he said, they let you board for free. And now you decided to put a hole in their ship. Right, in order to drown them, لِتُغْرِقَ أَهْلَهَا لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا إِمْرَى نُكْرَى إِمْرَى صحيح? The next one is نُكْرَى Where's the حفاظ? Am I wrong? Which one? إِمْرَى حسنت Where's Sheikh Bukhari? Oh, he's praying طيب and then he said to him, قال, ألم أقول إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا. Right? Oh, sorry, but خلنا تفنتلخ في إذا. We already mentioned it, right? He said to him, قال لا تأخذني بما نسيت. Right? Don't hold me to account for that which I done out of forgetfulness. فكانت الأولى من موسى نسيانا. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, the first strike was out of forgetfulness. Because he told him, don't ask me any questions, right? Huh? فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ Don't ask me any questions. Just listen to what I'm going to tell you. The first one was done out of forgetfulness. فَانْطَلَقَ فَإِذَا غُلَامٌ يَلْعَبُ مَعَ الْغِلْمَانِ فَأَخَذَ الْخَضِرُ بِرَأْسِهِ مِنْ عَلَاهُ فَاخْتَلَعَ رَأْسَهُ بِيَدِهِ So then they got off the ship, they began to walk. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and Khadir, they run into a young child. Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam grabs him and he pulls his head off his body, kills him. Qala Musa, aqatilta nafsan zakiyyatan mi ghayri nafs. Have you killed an innocent soul who has killed none? Right? Laqad jitta shay'an nukra, ahsant. Right? Indeed, you have carried out that which is extremely evil. Right? He made a hasty judgment about what Khadr alayhi salatu was done. قال, ألم أقول لك إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا. You can say معي and معي. Two different ways of reciting it. Right? Didn't I say to you that you wouldn't be able to be patient, O Musa? قال ابن عيينة وهذا أوكد فانطلق حتى إذا أتى يا أهل قرية استطعم أهلها فأبوا أن يضيفوهما. So then they continued walking, right? And they ran into a group of people who lived in a village, أهل قرية. They requested to be hosted. استطعم أهلها فأبوا أن يضيفوهما. And they refused to host them. They refused to host موسى and خضر عليه الصلاة والسلام. فوجد فيها جدارا يريد أن ينقض فأقامه قال لو شئت لاتخذت عليه أجرا And then after this interaction with the people of the village that took place they saw this wall that was on the verge of collapsing right? خضر عليه الصلاة والسلام noticed it he went towards it and put it straight he said to him if you want you can take uh, money for this you can charge them for straightening up the the wall this is when Khadir alayhi salatu was somehow enough. قال هذا فراق بيني وبينك. This is indeed the moment that we are going to separate from one another. Khadir says that to Musa. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, يرحم الله موسى. May Allah subhanahu wa taala have mercy upon Musa. لو ددنا لو صبر حتى يقص علينا من أمرهما. Right? I wish that he was patient so that, you know, we could hear about 
the rest, right? And that which was going to take place between them both. There's another narration that says, لَوَدِدْنَا لَوْ صَبَرْ لَأَبْصَرَ مِنْ صَاحِبِهِ الْعَجَبِ Right? If only he was patient, then he would have seen amazing things from his companion, meaning Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam. In the Quran, my brothers and my sisters, and this is not mentioned in the hadith, right? Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam then explains to him as to why he did everything. And I'm going to quickly mention it, inshaAllah ta'ala. He then goes on to explain. أما السفينة فكانت لمساكين يعملون في البحر فأردت أن أعيبها وكان وراءهم ملك يأخذ كل سفينة غصبا right now he explains to him as to why he did all of these things right he says to him as for the ship that he put a hole in it belonged to some مساكين some needy individuals who used to work on sea يعملون في البحر so I wanted to fault this ship. And that is because وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ أَيْ أَمَامَهُمْ مَلِكٌ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا Right? There was, in front of them, a king who would seize every ship by force. Right? So Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam, the reason why he put a hole in there is once now it reaches the shore, once the king sees that there is a fault inside of the ship, he's not going to take it. Does that make sense? So he wanted to fault it, that's why he, he did that. Second time, As for the child that he killed, Allah Azza tells us that he had parents that were both believers. However, we feared that he would be the cause that they apostate from the religion. Sa'id ibn Jubayr said, فَخَشِينَ أَنْ يَحْمِلَهُمَا حُبُّهُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُتَابِعَاهُ عَلَىٰ دِينِهِ Sa'id ibn Jubayr says that the meaning of this is that he was feared that because of how much they loved their son, it will lead them now to follow their beloved son to them into al-kufr, into renegating from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I killed him. Took him off the face of this earth. وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارُ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ Now this is number three, right? As for the wall that he straightened up, even though they refused to host them, he could have easily turned around, okay, you guys... Refuse to host us, forget about you guys, right? We're not going to do you any favors. Let the wall huh, come down. Let it crumble. Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us that this wall belonged to two orphans that lived in this village. And under it was buried a treasure that belonged to them, to these two needy, sorry, these two Aytam, these two orphans. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحَا And their father was righteous. And because of the righteousness of their father, فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَا شُدَّهُمَا وَيَسْتَخْرِجَا كَنْزَهُمَا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the day grow older, right? After reaching the age of puberty, they would take this kenz, this treasure that was buried underneath this wall, that was about to crumble. Maybe had it crumbled, the people in the village would start fighting over this kens that would be unraveled from the ground, right? How often do we find that? You've got uncles who are looking for ways to seize that inheritance away from their own nephews and nieces. Very, very common as someone who does a lot of inheritance distribution. You've got an uncle who's here, and then all of his family is back home in Pakistan or in India or in Somalia, right? If he passes away tomorrow, he's telling me, I fear that my own brothers and sisters are going to seize, right? All of my properties and the land that I possess back home. And nothing is going to be left for my own children, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for all of these treasures to remain buried. So once they grow older, they can take it. Right? 
Before, inshallah ta'ala, I start mentioning these 15 benefits, my brothers and my sisters, and I'm going to give you guys a break in exactly five minutes. How long have we been going on for? I think it's only half an hour, right? It has been half an hour because we finished late. No. So let's give another 15 minutes, inshallah. Was Khadr alayhi salatu was salam a Nabi or was he just a righteous man? This is a discussion that the scholars have amongst themselves. Right? They say, or they put forth arguments such as how can one of the greatest prophets go to another man to seek knowledge? Well, I can, this is not something that should be strange at all. The Prophet وسلم, at times would seek the consultation of his own companions, right? There was times when when Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala anhu would say something and it would be different to what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi suggested, Allah would send down revelation agreeing with Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is not a solid argument. The majority of the scholars, they say that Khadr alayhi salatu was salam was in fact a prophet. What's the evidence for this? After he explained why he did all of these three things, right? What is it that he said? وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي I did not do this out of my own accord. Right? I didn't do it out of my own accord. Meaning, all of these calls that I made, right? All of these decisions, all of these moves, were due to the revelation that was coming down upon me. وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي ذَلِكَ تَأْوِيلُ مَا لَمْ تَسْطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا And this is now the explanation for that which you weren't patient for, O Musa. Right? Like when you think about it now, for him to take the life of a young child, how does Khadr know that he's going to become a disbeliever when he grows older? And because of his disbelief now, his parents are going to follow him upon kufr due to the amount of love that they have for him. This only can be done by way of revelation, right? Hmm. 15 benefits, my brothers and my sisters, from this wonderful story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us in the Quran. Some of these benefits have been taken from the great Imam, Imam al-Si'di, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatan wasi'ah, and other scholars, and somewhere out of contemplation, Benefit number one, my brothers and my sisters. Everything that you see taking place happens for a reason. All right, I'll say that again. And I'm hoping, inshallah ta'ala, you guys have your pens and your papers. All right? Unless you're like Imam al-Bukhari or Imam al-Shafi or Imam al-Hanifa that's just able to take everything in. Huh? The moment they hear it, then you're okay not to write it down. But brothers and sisters, wallahi al azim these benefits that we write down, right, will come in handy maybe 10, 15 years down the line. I still go back to benefits that I wrote maybe 10 years ago when I was seeking knowledge. And because I need it now, I search on my phone because of iCloud, right? We have iCloud. Up until recently, I was making dua for Steve Jobs that Allah guides him to Al Islam. You guys heard of Steve Jobs? And one time I said in a lecture, someone put his hand up and said, Ustad, just to let you know, Steve Jobs passed away. Are you allowed to make dua for someone who has passed away? Upon kufr? No. But I was making dua for him all the way up until recently. Right? Why was I making dua for this non-Muslim that Allah guides him to Islam? It's because of these iPhones. Huh? The notes. You know the notes on the iPhones? As for Galaxy, guys, I, I have no interest and I don't know anything about it. Right? I'm a loyal Apple fan. Right, that's the only phone I've ever had since these phones came into existence, and I will continue to have it. And that's not free promotion for Apple, so Mohandas needs to cut that out. Does that make sense? These notes that we write down, even if you lose your phone, you can what retrieve everything that you had on your phone by way of iCloud. Right, I've got pages on there benefits from 2016, 2015, 2014, all the way up until this year. And every now and again I go through it and I take it out. The poet he said, It is a must that the talib, the student, he carries with him scrap paper. He writes when he rides and he writes when he walks. This is a serious student of knowledge. 
or someone who really wants to improve himself and take away benefit. Because we're living in the 21st century, I changed it up a little bit so that it can be relevant and relatable. Instead of saying kunashin, I change it to la budda li talibi min aybadin. It's a freshy way of saying iPad. Huh? La budda li talibi min aybadin instead of kunashin. Yaktubu fihi rakiban umashin. So it, it rhymes. Meaning we carry with us these gadgets and we note down the benefits whenever we hear it because no one's going to carry scrap paper with them today. Right? On the notes, and as for Galaxy, I don't know what you guys have on there. Huh? You write down whenever you hear these benefits. And then later on, what do you do? You collect like for like benefits and you put them all somewhere. Right? So the first benefit, my brothers and my sisters, everything that you see taking place happens for a reason. Right? Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam, he put a hole in that ship. There was a reason for it. Right? This is just a very, very small example of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows things to take place. Which we at times may not be able to comprehend. Likewise, the fact that he took the life of this young man. And also why he decided to straighten up this wall. Even though he could have easily chosen not to. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? So if this is happening now between two human beings, Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam and Musa, and he's telling him after he's done all of this that there is a reason for it. What does that show us, my brothers and my sisters, when we go through calamities and hardships? You may not see the good in it, my brothers and my sisters. Walakin, wallahu ya'lamu wa antum. لا تعلمون. Allah knows and you don't know my brothers and my sisters. Right? In the month of Ramadan, I went to visit one of my friends. And then his mother walked in and she said, Muhammad, I'm not fasting today. I said to auntie, why are you not fasting today? She said, because I'm angry with Allah. Wallahi alladhi la ilaha ghayruh. I'm not exaggerating. She said, I am angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لماذا هي غضبانة? Why is she angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right. Even though normally she carries out acts of worship, from the apparent, she's trying her utmost best. But the reason why she said she's angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because of all of the different trials and hardships that her children are going through. She's old enough to be the grandmother of some of us, my brothers and my sisters. She has grandchildren. Does that make sense? She has grandchildren. Some of our children are going through hardships and difficulties in their marriages. She goes, even though I pray, I fast, right? Why is Allah making me go through all of this? I reminded her, auntie, you know this house that we're sitting in? It is the biggest house that I have visited here in Leicester. That I've personally visited. Of course, there might be bigger houses that are a lot more spacious. But it's the biggest house that I've personally entered into here in Leicester. I said, auntie, I don't think you've ever woken up. Except that there was food in your fridge. And if there isn't food in your fridge, you have the finance to go and buy food. You have all of this, right? And you're upset at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata. Liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu. Right? This life is a life of what? Tests and trials. You can't expect to have a life that is going to be filled with flowers and bliss. and No, they are trials and tribulations. Right? أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَانْ أَلَنْبِيَاءَ فَالْأَمْثَلْ فَالْأَمْثَلْ يُبْتَلُ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ دِينِهِ The most severely tested people are who? The prophets, those like them, and then those that are like them. One is tested in accordance to how much he adheres to his religion. Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, one time I gave a khutbah on this, right? I think it was last week in Coventry. And we extrapolated some benefits from the story of Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam in the Quran. Some of the scholars of tafsir, they say, after... I believe it was 60 years of living a life of extravagance. Allah gave him so much, right? He had so much, my brothers and my sisters, children, wealth, health, servants, right? And then Allah Azza wa Jalla took all of that away from him so quickly, right? SubhanAllah, first he lost his wealth, then he lost his children, right? 
And then brothers and sisters, he lost his health. It didn't stop there. Everyone abandoned him, forsaked him. Except his wife and some of the Mufassirun, they mentioned two of his relatives that would come and visit him from time to time. The reason why they abandoned him because of this strong smell, this odor that would come out of his body due to the skin disorder that he was suffering from. Right? And even then he wasn't ungrateful. Right? He wasn't ungrateful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us what? انظروا إلى من هو أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم فأجدروا ألا تزدروا نعمة الله. Look at those who have less than you. Don't look at those who have more. That will make you so much more thankful. Some of us are complaining about the council flat, brothers and sisters. Many don't even have a roof over their heads. Look at what's happening in Syria and Turkey. Right? Well, like one of the uncles that I was with after the Jum'ah went to eat, he was saying that he went, right? And he visited what was happening there. He goes, even though they're living in very difficult circumstances, one thing I took away is that they have yaqeen, they have certainty of Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? Are you brothers and sisters with me? Whenever you begin to right, feel as if you're being deprived, look at those who are less fortunate than you. Everything that happens, my brothers and my sisters, happens for a reason. Let me ask you all a question. How many a time have we been in a situation where we thought that this was the best thing for us? To make it even more clear, I'll give the example that every single one of you guys can relate to. Right? There's this sister that you so badly want. Princess Charming. You're telling yourself there isn't a sister on the face of this earth that is better for me than huh? this lady here. Right? Bushra. Right? And this lady here. You try everything in your power now to acquire this lady to get married to her. And then to make things even worse, huh? Right? It's not happening, right? It's not happening. To make things even worse, your best friend comes and he snatches her from under your nose. Does it happen without a shadow of a doubt, my brothers and my sisters? I'll tell you guys a similar story that one time I came across. There was a brother who asked for their sister's hand in marriage. As the wedding day was getting closer and closer, he one time came to the house and he saw her sister walking past. Guess what? He dropped the sister that he wanted to marry and he said, I want to get married to her sister. This girl is of course heartbroken. What did she do? She went to a magician in order to have a magic spell done on him. Right? The ghayra, the jealousy led to her now falling into al-kufr. Magic. Right? فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجَ Allah tells us, وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ Allah tells us it's kufr in Surah Al-Baqarah. Right? Shahid ibn al-Kalam, she of course didn't think to herself, you know what, this is probably happening because Allah has got something better in store for me. No. That wasn't the case. I want him. He's not going after my sister. ماذا حصل كفرت بالله عز وجل Right, that's serious my brothers and my sisters Anyways, going back to the incident that I was relating You're heartbroken You really wanted, you really badly wanted Bushra huh? It didn't work out for you Years go by, Allah عز وجل blesses you with a lady That has qualities and characteristics that the mind can't imagine Right this is when you say, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have this today. There are brothers that I know, they will say, Wallahi, the divorce that they went through was the best ever thing that ever happened to their lives. Right? Because you could have indeed been in a more difficult situation, especially if you had children with that lady that you divorced. How many cases do I know? Right? They're battling out in court over custody rights. She just wants to rinse him. She knows that the law is on her side. But I want him to suffer. Let him spend all of these thousands. Just so huh, she can throw a dagger through him. When well, you went through a divorce, there's no children there. Everything happens for a reason. Allah Azza wa protects us from a lot, of, a lot of evil, my brothers and my sisters. And at times we don't actually see it. Right? Even Ibn Taymiyyah, my brothers and my sisters, 
He says, لَوْلَا مِحَنُ الدُّنْيَا وَمَصَائِبُهَا لَأَصَابَ الْعَبْدِ مِنْ أَدْوَاءِ الْكِبِرِ وَالْعُجْبِ وَالْفَرْعَنَةِ وَقَسْوَةِ الْقَلْبِ مَا هُوَ سَبَبُ هَلَاكِهِ عَاجِلًا Right? غير عاجل If it wasn't for these trials and these difficulties and the hardships, adversities that come our way then the servant would be afflicted with right the disease of arrogance and i don't think any of us want to meet allah azza wa with arrogance even a mustard grain of arrogance لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من الكبر a mustard grain of kibr that you have in your heart you're not entering the jannah as the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he says the diseases of kibr self amazement even firauni characteristics and traits and hardness of the heart that which will be the cause of him being destroyed in this dunya before the hereafter and then he says wa min rahmati arhamir rahimin from the mercy of the most merciful upon this individual right that allah azza wa jal causes him to go through all of these hardships and difficulties how is this a rahma you're probably thinking to yourself right wa min rahmati arhamir rahimin an yatafaqqadahu fi ba'd al-ahyan right in order to keep your feet on the ground, brothers and sisters, to keep us humbled, wallah, it's a huge reminder. Does that make sense? It is a huge reminder, right? To keep us on the ground. How many a time have I seen people who are filthy rich, right? You sit down with him and you feel so small when the way he's speaking to you and the speaking about you or the way he's, <coughs> you know, portraying himself. And then he ends up losing everything. He's sending me a GoFundMe page. Please, Akhi, I'm in a difficult situation. Put this on your social media. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha ghayru. Right? I'm thinking to myself, subhanAllah, you know. More you begin to read about some of these gems and pearls of the great scholars, of, like this one, subhanAllah. Begin to realize why Allah Azza wa Jal may choose certain things for others. Right? So like we said, my brothers and my sisters, the first is what? Everything happens for a reason. This is just a small example of this point that we're trying to make, this qissa of Khadr wasam. if you're struggling now to understand, right? Why Khadr wasam took this decision to kill this young man, but then he informed Musa for the reason why, right? Apply the same now, right, for everything else. I wouldn't be sitting here, my brothers and my sisters, if my friend wasn't shot. And Allah knows best. Right. When I sometimes contemplate and reflect on the occurrences across 20 years, I was in London, right? A friend of mine was shot. And I was at his funeral. You guys heard of Universal TV? Somalis, Wagarnayan. Huh? Universal TV, very well known TV channel Happened to come to this funeral And it recorded me while I was crying By Maghrib time, my mother is receiving phone calls From across the world Oh, was your child part of this gang? Huh? Was he part of this gang? And then I got pulled into the office Ta'al, come sit down, Muhammad and they told me to watch myself on the news, right? And this is when they took the decision to move me out to Leicester. When this happened, my brothers and my sisters, it was the reason why so many brothers left the streets. Many went to Egypt, some went to Medina, some moved out. Everything happens for a reason. Even though from the apparent brothers and sisters, it appears as if, how can Allah Azza wa Jal allow someone who's so young to be killed in such a brutal way, right? Mm. Everything happens for a reason. Another example, car crash. A mother and her three children. She's the only one that comes out alive and the rest of these young children who still haven't experienced life, they've passed away. The atheist will ask, right? If there's really a God, why is he allowing this to take place? Atheists always ask this question, right? 
the problem of evil, they call it, which is discussed in university settings. Why didn't God stop this from taking place? Ha, ah, my brothers and my sisters, who can answer this question for me? Ah. Everything happens for a reason. But I want a more of a deeper answer based on what we just took. Mm. But who can now put that into perspective with the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Huh? Mm. Guys, the story of Musa and this incident now of these three children dying in a car crash. And the only one that lives is the mother. Right? The story of when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam saw Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam killing this young man. What was the reasoning behind it? The Prophet ﷺ told us, وَلَوْ عَاشَ لَأَرْحَقَ أَبَوَيْهِ تُغْيَانًا وَكُفْرًا Had he lived, he would have been the reason as to why they start violating against the laws of Allah Azza wa Jal. You never know, Allah could have been protecting this mother from all the trouble that these three kids would have brought her later on down the line. Agreed? You know how many times I've heard a parent say, right, I wish I never had you as a child. The parent is extremely worried. What happened to my child? He's still not home yet at 12 a.m. 1 a.m. is not home. Has he been nicked? Has he been taken by the police? What's happened to him? Is he alive? Is he not? The parent can't go to sleep peacefully. Years go past like that. And that is because the child has become so astray. All that trouble, right? That the parent has to go through. Allah could have been protecting his lady from that, right? Everything happens for a reason, my brothers and my sisters. Right? There is a sheikh that I know that taught Sheikh Abu Sam, and Sheikh Abu Sam was telling me, right? That his sheikh actually ran away from a war zone in Africa. And then when he came to Medina, he became a sheikh in the Haram. The African sheikh, he's teaching the Arabs. Right? Imagine that, brothers and sisters. That war was the reason why he comes there. A lot of us here, my brothers and my sisters, where are our parents from? They are from countries, right, that were struck with wars after wars. Are they schizophrenic? Do you guys agree with that? I'm looking at some of our nationalities here. Right? They went through wars. And because of the war, you moved. And now you live here. You're making good money. You're educating yourself and your children. They are going to now become professionals and you're helping out your brothers and sisters when you send money back home to them, right? Right? Do we not send money home? Exactly. Allah Azza wa Jal works in the most amazing of ways. We don't see it. You're probably thinking to yourself, all these wars that are taking place. Why? You will understand later why. That's the first benefit, my brothers and my sisters, we're going to take a five minute break and then we'll take the remaining 14 inshallah ta'ala right after yeah it is 24 past please brothers five minutes if you need to do star jumps quickly stand up huh? get the blood circulating again and then we're going to take the remaining 14 inshallah ta'ala that will perhaps help us in this world before the hereafter طيب الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعث الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعياً إلى الله بإذنه وسراج منيرا. What was the first benefit, brothers? Huh? Everything happens for a reason. The aqdar that which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has decreed, right, is at times that which you can't put into comprehension. Only later on it might appear to you that Subhanallah, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have this today. So Allah, let Allah Azza wa Jal. Right, execute that which he has decreed for us, right? And be patient. Be someone, my brothers and my sisters, who is patient. And with patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open doors that the mind couldn't imagine. Right? Number two, my brothers and my sisters, is not being hasty in passing judgments. Right? Not being hasty in passing out judgments. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam more than once contested that which Khadr alayhi salatu wasalam did, right? How could you do this? Right? 
they allowed you to board the ship without taking a payment from you and then you decided to fault the ship that you're on? Why would you do that? And then after he said to him, لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا نُكْرَى After he killed that young man, indeed you, what you're doing is so evil. Right? I think this is very, very important to my brothers and my sisters, especially for someone who is now starting that journey in seeking knowledge. You learn a little bit here and there, what happens, you begin to think that you are Shaykh al-Islam. Whatever you have studied is either that way or the highway. Agreed? Not realizing that at times there are different angles that people look at things, different perspectives. All that which is required of you is to ask, why? What is your perspective on this? Ustaz Ubaidah knows, when we was in the car, right? I'm going to read that what the brother messaged me, right? Out of the blue, I haven't spoken to this brother for months. Out of the blue, he messages me the following. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ma laka ya rajul? What is wrong with you, so-and-so? This is the first thing I get. What is wrong with you? Allah al-musta'an. Ahsin sayrak. Ya akhi, wattaqi Allah, fa innaka satalqa Allah, wa sawfa tara amalak. When I read it out to Ustaz Ubaid, he was in shock. He goes, what did you do? He says to me, rectify your methodology. And fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Because you're going to meet Allah Azza wa Jal tomorrow. And then you will be presented your actions. Up until now, I don't know what he's talking about. Right? And he says, the people are looking at you the same way one sits in front of his sheikh. They are taking from you that which you are doing with your actions. Up until now, I have no idea what he's talking about. Tell you, my brothers and my sisters, what have I done? Am I someone who... It's perfect. No, I'm going to make mistakes. Right? At times I'm going to fall short. But at least have a conversation with me. There are certain issues, my brothers and my sisters, right, that are not carved in stone. Sometimes some of us may see an individual, right, or someone in da'wah making a particular move. He has a certain judgment call. He sees things a certain way. I'm not talking about al-musallamat. But it is something that is open for interpretation. How we're going to maybe carry this out. He sees that to be better than maybe what you might think. And he has his reasons for it. And you're thinking to yourself, how is this individual behaving like this? Ask him why. Right? Don't just take whatever you see as a perspective, right? Like gospel as they say. And then I said to him, Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What happened? Wallah, I was not planning on mentioning this today in the class. Right? But I've been seeing this reoccur, right? Time and time again with brothers who have gone abroad, they're seeking knowledge. They've learned a little bit here and there. And now they've become extremely opinionated at that which other brothers are doing back home. I'm not saying you can't have your own view. You are entitled to whatever view you want. But the moment, start, the moment now that you start making all of these negative remarks about someone who might be a lot more senior than you or a lot more experienced than you, right? And you start maybe even defaming him, right? Because you've not understood. Maybe four or five brothers that I've engaged with over the last couple of weeks after having a conversation with them and showing them the perspective of others, they said, oh, subhanAllah, you're right. So I said to this brother, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, what happened? <laughs> the response I get was, akhi, wallahi, we need to have a sit down or a call, inshallah. Hey, brother, just tell me, what was the issue? And then I explained to him, akhi, if you want to maybe put forth a particular view or a perspective, then put it forth in a manner that is what? Befitting. And I said, Sahih, I'm sorry, I should have approached it better. I'm going to call you one of these days, Akhi, inshallah. And then I sent him a screenshot of the second benefit that I wanted to mention today. Right. 
And then later on, it was about some picture that he saw. Someone took a selfie with me, right? As many people do. You guys know this. Sometimes someone says, ah, can I take a picture with you? I don't want to say no to the brother. I don't know what that brother is upon. He could be a drug dealer. Huh? He could be anything. <laughs> Does that make sense? Am I wrong to say this? He could be a drug dealer. Am I going to ask him, okay, so what do you do from the moment you wake up? Huh? Or which masjid do you go to? Yeah, you, like, there, there's a lot of things that happen, right? Just ask and learn to say why. Or what is your reasoning for this? Don't be musta'jil. In Somali, they call it sef labut. Huh? Where the guy just takes out what? His sword. And he starts cussing people, he starts cutting people up. Akhi, take it easy. As the poet says, take it easy. Don't be hasty in placing blame on your brother. Perhaps he might have an excuse that you are not aware of. Right? So what I wrote down, wrote down here, you know, sometimes I just get these thoughts. You may enter into a discussion with ideas that you already set on. Right? You are not someone who's looking to maybe improvise or explore the other perspectives that are out there. And this is a problem for a student of knowledge. You never learn like that. If you just hear one thing, you take it as gospel, you carve it into stone, this is what I'm going to follow. And you're not open to maybe improvising some of these issues that are open for ijtihad interpretation. I'm not talking about matters of aqidah that are what? from the usul of our religion. We're talking about things that are open for interpretation. You know the scholars of the past, they would say, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَعْرِفَ خَطَأَ شَيْخِكْ فَجَالِسْ غَيْرَهُ If you want to know the mistake of your sheikh, then go and sit elsewhere. Perhaps he might give you a perspective on something that you weren't previously aware of. Right? And when you do behave like this, and you start maybe approaching the matter in this very hasty way, that person will just look at you and think, this guy is just another rookie, right? Inexperienced, immature, right? Who's lacking basic etiquettes. Does that make sense to my brothers and my sisters? That's why in the voice note, I, forward, I forwarded it to this brother that I sent to another couple of brothers. I'm not saying you can't have a view. Just ask for the perspective of others. That's the basic right that he has over you. You've just started seeking knowledge right now. You've gone abroad. You've heard a couple of perspectives, right? Just ask. Likewise, at times, my brothers and my sisters, our parents may ask us to do certain things. And you're thinking to yourself, Akhiri, you know, my parent here is back home, or he comes from back home, uh, Somalia or Pakistan. He's out of date or he's out of touch with reality. One thing you'll never be able to get over those who are older than you, especially your parents, is experience. Not that I'm saying everything they say is going to be 100% right or always in line with what Allah Azza wa Jalla Messiah Allah Azza said, but they have experience over you, even at times when it comes to marriage. They may say something to you that, you know, doesn't make sense to you. And you might be someone who is knowledgeable, right? You're not seeing their perspective. It's just important to just. Lend it to your ear. Take it seriously. He's got experience over you. All right? Benefit number three, my brothers and sisters. What was number one? Everything happens for his number two. Don't be hasty in passing out judgments. Take it easy. All right? Benefit number three, right? After he killed that boy, you've killed an innocent soul. Musa alayhi salatu wasam said to Khadir, you've indeed done something that is extremely evil. He's saying this to the teacher. Right? What do we take from this, my brothers and sisters? That taking an innocent life is something that is extremely, extremely, extremely evil. It's not a light matter. Right? I'm sure a lot of us, my brothers and my sisters, we saw a video of that rapper called DJ Khalid when he went to the Kaaba. Upon seeing the Kaaba, what was his reaction, my brothers and my sisters? 
من يخبرني؟ What happened the moment he saw the Kaaba? He began to cry. Why you guys acting like I don't know? Huh? He began to cry. He burst into tears. Looking at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This man, my brothers and my sisters, who's openly involved in sin, making music videos upon seeing the Kaaba, he broke down into tears. Right? What did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell us? لَهَدْمُ الْكَعْبَةِ حَجَرًا حَجَرًا أَهْوَنُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ قَتْلِ مُسْلِمٍ You guys seen the Kaaba? Would anyone ever think about punching the Kaaba? Or striking the Kaaba? Or looking to dismantle the house of Allah عز و جل? Even if your close friend tried to do that, right, you're going to take him out. Right? This person is not in his right mind. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, that the Kaaba is destroyed. And then each part of the Kaaba is removed. Imagine now the Kaaba being destroyed, right? That crane is brought and it is smashed. And then each part is moved out of the Ka moved out of the haram. It's being walked out with. This is still not as bad as taking the life of a Muslim. Why do you have Muslims killing and stabbing one another? That is because they haven't understood, right? The sanctity of a human being that claims la ilaha illallah. I'll tell you guys something, my brothers, my sisters, right? Then the Messiah told us. If two Muslims, they square up to one another with their swords or with their weapons. Both the killer and the one killed is in the hellfire. Both of them are in the hellfire. So the companions, they ask, they, we understand the one who killed, what about the one who was killed? Next time you think about carrying a weapon, right? To square up to your Muslim brother, remember this hadith, Al-Qatilu wal maqtulu fin nar Both the killer and the killed is in the hellfire. So they ask, why? I understand the one who was killed, but what about the one who was killed? The one who killed is in the hellfire, what about the one who was killed? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَرِيصًا عَلَىٰ قَتْلِ صَاحِبِهِ He was extremely eager in wanting to take the life of the killer. Isn't this exactly what he wanted to do when he squared up to him with a knife or with a weapon? Except that the killer got there first. صحيح? He had that firm determination to carry out the act. So both of them are in the hellfire the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us. Right? We take it so lightly, right? Something so trivial in our eyes. Number four, my brothers and my sisters. What we learn from this, my brothers and my sisters, is weighing the pros and the cons and taking the lesser of the two evils. Right? Write down, taking the lesser of the two evils. Taking the lesser of the two evils. Khadr والسلام, was inspired. He had revelation sent down upon him to take the life of this young child. Sahih? And that is because he knew what he would do when growing older. What was going to happen? For those who were paying attention earlier. Once he grows older, what is he going to do? He's going to disbelieve and also his parents because of how much they love him, they're going to follow him into disbelief. Sahih? Which one is worse? What Khadr alayhi salatu wasam done, or this child now growing older, and then being the reason why another two Muslims, they renegate. Huh? Which one's worse? Allah says in the Quran, وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ بِنَ الْقَتَلِ Being trialed in your religion, walking on the face of this earth, and then your religion has been trialed, is far worse than having your soul taken away from you. And of course, my brothers and my sisters, no one here can go and just take a life because I think when he becomes older, he's going to do X, Y, and Z. No, my brother, you're not a prophet. Huh? Just in case someone is thinking that he should use the story of Khadr والسلام, to take the life of someone who's causing havoc on the face of this earth. That's not your right, my friend. Also, just in case we have Channel 4 who want to take things out of context. Right? Are you guys with me? 
taking the lesser of the two evils. This is a very important legal maxim. Right? And we learned this in Qawaid al Fakhiya. الدين مبني على المصالح في جلبها ودر إلى القباح فإن تزاحم عدد المصالح يقدم الأعلى من المصالح وضده تزاحم يرتكب الأدنى من المفاسد weighing the pros and the cons sometimes you're in a predicament where you have two evils and you have to pick one of them what do you do the Sharia says that you have to take the lesser of the two evils I'll give you guys a couple of examples إن شاء الله تعالى that I didn't go through last week in Derby because I ran out of time First example that I want to give you guys, and I want you guys to give me the answer. Right? We're taking a lot of different topics here. And with the Quran, you could do that. Right? Qawaid al Fiqhir comes in, Tatbiqiyan. Hmm? You have a masjid, and they have this Imam that smokes outside. As soon as he, leads, as soon as he finishes leading us, he goes outside and he starts smoking. Maraikum. You have the Imam in the masjid. May Allah protect our Imam, Sheikh Muhammad. But imagine, after finishing the salah, he's standing there, you know? No. Huh? I don't think anyone will respect him after that, right? So imagine now you have the Imam of a masjid. Maybe I shouldn't use that as an example. Astaghfirullah wa But the Imam goes outside, and then he what? He starts smoking. Right? To make it even worse, he lights up some weed and he starts smoking weed outside. And this is actually one of the examples that the scholars mentioned that I took from. Under this qa'idah when explaining qawaid al fiqhiyah Right? However, his tribe, they run the masjid. And they are what? Qabaliyun. Huh? They're individuals who are fanatic over their tribe. They're not going to have this individual now being taken out. He might have Quran. MashaAllah, he's got a lovely voice. But somebody like that, is it befitting for him to be leading the salah? No. Not at all. Especially if he's doing open sin, right? There are another group of individuals who come to the masjid and they request for him to be removed. Right? Him being removed from the masjid is either going to cause a war in the masjid or is going to lead to the masjid being closed down because the authorities are about to get involved. So now, let me put forth the situation. You have someone who's leading the salah that smokes and does sins openly the moment he finishes with his prayer, leading the Muslimin. You've got that, right? You can't remove him except by causing a war in the masjid, which may potentially lead to bloodshed. Or the house of Allah as the wajal being closed down because of this fiasco that is going to place due to the authorities getting involved. What should we do here, guys? Should we leave him in place or should we start a war? Or get... Keep him. Huh? Keep him. It's the lesser of the two evils. This qaida comes in extremely, extremely handy. Here's the predicament. We don't have a third option. Jamil. Right? To even lessen the evil even more, right? Akhi, if you're going to sin, go and do it in private. Stop smoking weed outside of the masjid. Does that make sense? Jazakallah khair. Give you guys another example. I've got a whole load of examples. That which makes Qawaid al fiqh and also Sul fiqh very interesting is the examples that are mentioned. Otherwise, it can get very boring. <coughs> a father he has a daughter. Two people, they ask for a hand in marriage, right? One of them has the correct aqidah. However, he falls into some haram, right? Even though he has the correct aqidah and, you know, he follows the sunnah of the Messiah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, generally speaking. However, he has certain sins that he carries out. Another, my brothers and my sisters, or the other person that asked for his daughter's hand in marriage, He's someone who propagates innovation, bid'ah. However, he doesn't carry out these sins, right? And the situation is that you have to pick one of the two. Which one should I give my daughter to? First. Why the first? 
this guy has khuluq with deen, so he's a nice, he's etiquette, but he just has bid'ah, but he has good etiquette and manners. And he doesn't do any of these haram things that the person upon tawheed does, it, or aqeedah does. Which one is worse, bid'ah or sins? Good. Ahsantum. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala, anhuma, he said, Al-bid'ah ahabbu ila iblis min al ma'siyah Innovation is more beloved to Iblis than what? Than sinning. Why is that? Because the person who's doing bid'ah, innovations in the deen, he thinks he's getting closer to Allah. But the guy who sins, right, he'll say to you, please make dua for me, man. Even the guy who's sleeping around, committing haram, your advisor goes, please, I'm sorry. May Allah forgive me. But the other guy doesn't. Agreed? Right? And this guy is just going to consist and he's going to continue, right? So this is one of the examples that the ulama mentioned. طيب. Another example. Oh, I love this. Lying, is it haram? Yes. Type. There is someone inside of your house that some gangsters are trying to kill. He's hiding inside of your house. They come knocking on your door. They were like, where's Muhammad? Should you lie here? Because if you don't lie, they're going to take his life. Which one's worse? Them taking his life or you lying? Without a shadow of a doubt. This is what? Are you going to hand him? Oh, wallah, I'm not allowed to lie. Tfaddalu. Huh? Take his life. Namais. <laughs> طيب. Someone is praying and then the samosas and the bajio and also of the other nice foods have been placed in front of him while he's praying. Right? And now he really badly wants to pray, uh, wants to eat this. Which is going to cause his khushu' you know his concentration in the salah to disappear, to diminish. However, he has to pray right now otherwise the time of the salah is going to finish. Which one's more important, praying on time or you now praying without khushu'? Because generally speaking, what did the Messenger tell us? Huh. Right? If the time of the salah kicks in but then the dinner is presented, which one do you do? You eat first, the Messenger told us, and then you go and pray. But there's still time left. But now there's only a little bit of time left. And you have to pray on time, otherwise the time is going to finish. But you are praying now while your stomach is rumbling. Which one is the lesser of the two evil? For you now to pray without khushur or for you to pray outside of his time? Outside of the time. Is less? Without khushur. Without khushur is the lesser of the two evils. Does that make sense? Because your salah is still valid. Except now that you're doing it in its proper time. Delaying the salah to outside of his time. It's very dangerous, guys. It's actually from the major sins. Right? It's actually from the major sins. Praying whenever you want. I'm going to pray when I get home. Nine to five, there are three prayers that you might have to pray, especially in the winter. Agreed? Dohor, Asr, and Maghrib. So he says, I'm going to pray when I get home. My brothers and my sisters, it's actually from the major sins to delay all of the prayers till after when I get home. Right? This is a serious sin. Tayyib. Well, I was going to mention this, but we have little kids here. Let me ask you guys a question. Eating najasa, is it allowed? Impurities. Huh? Eating najasa is allowed? No. But now, my brothers and my sisters, you're in a situation where you're going to lose life. I remember there was a situation where yeah. yeah there was a situation that was presented where they done a uh, a heart implant to someone who was about to die and the only heart that they could find that would function is the heart of a pig 
Otherwise, he's going to lose his life. Nothing else is going to work here. This is what the doctors concluded with. Are your brothers and sisters with me? Heart of a pig, brothers. Khinzir is haram. Even his heart is haram. Huh? But now his heart is going to save a life. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? To use the heart of a pig or to allow this life to be lost? It's haram, but to save a life. Agreed? This example that is mentioned by Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi, I think is very, very important and very relevant as well. Samahuna ya jama'ah, for anyone who might feel. Inshallah, make sure you get the other benefits online, huh? Um, this example, my brothers and my sisters, someone who was in a haram relationship, he was carrying out a zina, right? We're talking about someone who, right, had the means to carry out this major sin, and then he separated away from being in this haram relationship. However, he finds himself in a predicament where his sexual desires spiral out of control. And this individual has previously tried and not some random individual goes, well, I think I'm going to fall into zina. I'm not talking about that one. We're talking about someone who had the means. Right? This individual now, Allah is getting very, very tempted and has because of what he was falling into before to commit this haram. And he has to relieve his desires. Otherwise, he may fall into a zina. من تهيأت له الأسباب المحرمة That's what we're talking about. Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi And also this is one of the more correct views of Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi They talk about how if this one is this in, in, in this predicament of he's going to fall into a zina however that which may prevent him from a zina is what? الاستمناه باليد Right? Which means masturbation. Which one is worse, my brothers and my sisters? A zina or the other? Zina. And by the way, brothers and sisters, no one take this out of context. We are talking about someone who's going to fall into haram. He was falling into haram. And now he stayed away from it. And now it's getting very tempting. Not just some random individual who, oh, Wallahi, I think. Oh, no, we're not talking about that. He has to what here, in this case, lesser of the two evils. What was number four, guys? Taking the lesser of the two evils. We just took some qawaid al fiqhiyah as well. Number five now, my brothers and my sisters. Number five. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects your offspring through your righteousness. Right. Allah azza wa jal will protect your offspring, my brothers and my sisters, through your righteousness. What's my evidence? Wa kana abuhuma saliha. The third incident. When he saw that wall that was on the verge of collapsing, Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam straightened it up. And what did Allah Azza wa Jalla say? That is because their father was righteous. So Allah wanted to protect them and also their wealth. Sahih? Why was this mentioned? To give us a huge lesson. They say that his name was Kasih, this righteous man. And he was from the righteous. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma Hufidha bi salahi abawayhima Wa qila Wa kana baynahuma wa bayna al-ab al-salih Sab'atu aba' Subhanallah Some of the scholars they mention that That this righteous man my brothers and my sisters Was seventh generation Ago He was the father of the seven generations ago like he was there as a father, he had children, and then they had children, and then and these guys were seventh generation. And because of his righteousness, they were protected. Because of his righteousness, they were protected, subhanAllah. Ala kulli hal, my brothers and my sisters, right? I had an email the other day of a sister saying to me, Where did you study? I really want to do tarbiyah of my child. I'm getting very worried about him. And then she tells me that her child's only two years of age. It's like, mashallah, the mother is thinking about her child, you know, even when it's still at the age of two, right? And I thought that was good. 
But what can we actually do to work towards our children being righteous? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting them. I'll give you guys four Quranic advices. Four Quranic instructions from Allah Azza wa Jal. If you want your children to turn out righteous, take this, my brothers and my sisters. Number one, right? Work on yourself. We got drug dealers saying, my brothers and my sisters, Wallahi, I want a righteous lady. I don't want these girls that I have as girlfriends. Well, like drug dealers say this to me. Because Akhi, she's not wife material. She's not wife material. The drug dealer is telling me this. Right? And he goes, I can't find a good wife. One of the tafasir of At-tayyibatu li At-tayyibin wa at-tayyibuna li At-tayyibat Wal-khabithatu li-khabithin wal-khabithun li-khabithat The pure are for the pure and then the evil and the filthy are for the filthy individuals. Have you heard the saying before? You'll always find the person that you're like. I, if you work on yourself, my brothers and my sisters, inshallah ta'ala, you'll find someone that, bi-idhnillahi al-bari, is good as well. And then eventually the children will, work, will grow up in a positive, righteous environment. Are you brothers with me? So what was the first one? Work on yourself. Aslih nafsak. When we talk about parenting, a lot of the time the young people, they switch off. Brothers, the smart individual is the one who thinks about his children before he's even married. What do I mean by that? By picking the right spouse, by picking the right spouse, that is you working towards the direction the children will go in. If you've got some road girl, right? Let's just say you marry a road girl. Where do you want your kids to grow up in it, guys? Or how do you want your kids to turn up? That was the first one. Number two, guys. أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ فِيهِمْ Right? Pray around them. Pray around them, brothers and sisters. Kids as young as one and a half years of age, they know how to pray. Anyone want to disagree with me? One and a half years of age, they know how to pray. Of course, not with khushu and uh, I'm going to do the ruku' properly and the sujood properly. No. But they know the actions of the salah. Where did they get it from? They got it from their parents because the parents pray in front of them. And even if you think about it, my brothers and my sisters, the hikmah, the wisdom behind why the Messenger said, The most virtuous prayer, right, that one can pray other than the obligatory prayers that you do in the masjid is your sunnah prayers that are at home. Right? The sunnah prayers you pray at home is better. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi told us that. Why? What are the hikam behind it? So the people in your household, they get accustomed and used to seeing their father praying. Does that make sense? They are visual learners. And likewise, kids as one and a half years of age, my brothers and my sisters, they know how to access YouTube videos. Right? They know how to access Omar and Hannah, brothers, sisters. They know how to access videos. How even to go on Instagram and start scrolling? Wallahi arifun. Hmm? They know this and they pick this up. Are you promises with me? You know when we hear the hadith, Kullu mawlood and yulad al-fitra fa'abawahu yahawidani wa yinasana wa yimajisani. This hadith, right, where the Messiah Asim said, every newborn is born upon the fitra, meaning the natural disposition, tawheed. But it's the parent that turns him into a Jew or into a Christian or into a Majusi. Is it only limited to these three? La. The child might even be turned into a Netflixer. Or into what? A movie addict. Right? And that's simply because the parent is glued to the TV. Series after series. Hollywood, Bollywood, Somaliwood, Kudar. Huh? They're watching this all the time. The child is watching his parents and they're going to do the exact same thing. Does that make sense? So what was the first one? Rectify yourself, number two. Pray amongst them. What was the evidence for it? Surah Ibrahim. رَبَّنَا إِجْعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَى Is that, did I say it right in the beginning? رَبَّنَا جَعَلْ نَعْمْ Oh Allah, make me 
from those who establish the prayer, and likewise make our children and offspring like that as well. Rabbana waj'alna, right? Sheikh Bukhari. Rabbana waj'alna muqeema. Is it? Rabbi ja'alni. Sometimes when you're quoting, it's different when you're leading. So that's the second one. Third one, my brothers and my sisters, is to make dua for them. Right? Aslih li dhulliyati, as Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned. Also the verse in Surah Al-Furqan, Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhulniyatina qurrata ayun. To make dua for them that Allah makes them righteous. The dua of the parent is accepted when he makes it for his child. That's how I got. And number four, my brothers and my sisters, seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the accursed shaitan with regards to our children. Right? Four things if you want your children to be rectified. SubhanAllah, when you come across some of these statements like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, عندما كان يصلي الليلة وابنه الصغير نائم فينظر إليه قائلا Whenever he used to pray at night and then his child would be sleeping, he would look at him. And as he's looking at him, he would say من أجلك يا بني Because of you I'm praying at night. ويتلو وهو يبكي عند قوله تعالى Right. And as he's reciting, or should I say, as he's praying, he would cry and then recite the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Not while praying, sorry. Right. While crying, he would recite the verse of Allah, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا His father was righteous. So he's rectifying himself. He's doing more just so Allah protects them later on. Sa'id ibn Musayb likewise أنه كلما أراد أن يصلي قيام الليل نظر إلى ابنه فقال Every time he wanted to pray the night prayer he would look at his child and he would say إني أزيد في صلاة ليصلحك الله وليحفظك ثم يبكي وهو يتلو I'm only praying so Allah Azza wa Jal rectifies you and preserves you and then he would recite the statement of Allah وكان أبوهما صالحا their father was righteous So whenever you begin to fear for your children my brothers and my sisters right then do these four things. Number six, my brothers and my sisters. Just a quick question. Yeah. How to qualify to be Sheikh, he asked, what are things that qualify or that cause you to become salih? Number one, we shouldn't ever claim to be righteous individuals. We should always do more because we don't know as to whether it is being accepted or not. We worship Allah between khawf and raja, between hope and fear. So we do righteous deeds as much as we can and we hope for it to be accepted. Yeah. Number six, my brothers and my sisters, وَمِنْهَا تَوَاضُعِ الْفَاضِلِ لِلْتَعَلُّمِ مِمَّنْ دُونَهُ Right. Who was more virtuous, Khadir or Musa? Musa alayhi sallatu wa sallam, who min ulil azm. He's more virtuous. Right. He, without a shadow of a doubt, is more virtuous than Khadir. However, he was humble. Right. And he went out to take knowledge from someone who is less than him. He was sent to Bani Israel, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And still he sets out on a journey now to go and take knowledge from Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam. What was number six? The humility of the one who is more virtuous, right? With those who are less than him or less virtuous than him. This is very, very important. Sometimes my brothers and my sisters... Uh, we pick up a little bit of knowledge and we think we've made it, right? Or we don't sit in gatherings because we don't want the people to think that we are in need, right? Sometimes the shaitan can creep in like that. You're someone who leads the salah. But now if you sit, people are going to think, oh, the imam's sitting there. Why is he leading when he's in need of this knowledge? La ya jama'a. Number seven, my brothers and my sisters. Oh, number six was the humility of someone who's more virtuous with someone who is less than him. Musa was more virtuous. He took knowledge from that or from the one who was more less than him. Number seven, you might be so knowledgeable in a particular field. 
you are amazing in fiqh or you're amazing in qiraat Allahumma barik we have a lot of brothers that are amazing in qiraat here right mashallah tabarakallah you've become extremely knowledgeable in the science of hadith or in fiqh or in qiraat right that shouldn't stop you now from taking knowledge from someone whose expertise lie elsewhere. Does that make sense? This is very, very important here. I'll give you guys an example that is a lot more relatable. I'm now a civil engineer, right? And I've become not just an ordinary civil engineer, someone who's top of his game or someone who's like the best of doctors. You are only good at that. The shaitan whispers, Akhi, you are a doctor, you're so knowledgeable in this field or in this sector. How can you go back to school by sitting in a masjid? Right? Right? Back to square one. Huh? Scraping your knees, taking knowledge. Nah, man, that's not for me. Had a ghalat kabir. Right? You are not better than Musa alayhi salatu wasam and still he humbled himself to take the expertise that he didn't have from someone who did. Does that make sense? Because there was that which Khadr alayhi salatu wasam had that Musa didn't. That's why he said to him, Allah Azza wa taught me things that you are not aware of and you have things that I am not aware of. Does that make sense? And the Messenger uh, and, and, sorry, Mujahid told us about our ego. He said, La mustakbir. Two people don't learn. The one who's shy and the one who's arrogant. Number eight, my brothers and my sisters, number eight. وَمِنْهَا التَّأَدُّبُ مَعَ الْمُعَلِّمِ What also we benefit from this, my brothers and my sisters, is having the correct manners with the teacher. Right? How to address him. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was sent to Khadr, how did he speak to him? هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتُ رُشْتَ Is it possible for me now to accompany you so that I can learn that which Allah Azza wa has taught to you. He didn't say to him, listen, I've been sent to you, give me the knowledge. No, it wasn't like that. He humbled himself. Is it possible for me now to acquire this knowledge from you? Right? You'll be surprised, my brothers and my sisters. When we acquire knowledge, it's very different to acquiring civil engineering or mathematics or whatever have you. Yusuf ibn al-Husayn, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Bil adabi tafhamul ilm. With etiquette, you will understand knowledge. Adorning yourself and beautifying yourself with the best of etiquettes, this is how you're going to what? Acquire knowledge, my brothers and my sisters. You will need to humble yourself to address that teacher in the best possible way. As Zuhri rahmatullahi alayhi said, Kana Abu Salamat al Kufi Yumari ibn Abbas. He says, Abu Salamat al Kufi used to have arguments with Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, who had. So much knowledge with regards to the Quran, the Prophet made dua for him. He says he was deprived of so much knowledge because of how he used to address Ibn Abbas. As a teacher, my brothers and my sisters, it can get very irritating. Right? If someone is not asking in the most befitting of ways, right, you're thinking to when is the guy gonna stop? When is he gonna get out of my face? As opposed to someone who's very gentle, right? who asks in a very, very nice way, respectful. Even Ibn Abd al-Bari says, عن بعض السلف من كان حسن الفهم من كان حسن الفهم رضيء الاستماع لم يقوم خيره بشره Someone who has good understanding, but he has, he's a very bad at listening. We have two ears and one tongue for a reason. You've got two ears, so you can listen more. You can speak less. That's why you have one tongue. Not two. Huh? He says, لم يقوم خيره بشره The good is not going to outweigh the evil here or the bad here. Huh? Even Ibn Juraj, he said, my brothers and my sisters, لم أستخرج العلم الذي استخرجت من عطاء إلا برفقي به All this knowledge that I acquired from عطاء it was only because I was nice and gentle towards him. Right? Abdullah ibn Ahmed في كتاب العلل Right? You can find it in there. He says, كان عروة بن الزبير يحب ممارات ابن عباس. عروة بن الزبير used to like arguing with Abdullah ibn Abbas. فكان يخزن علمه عنه. He used to hold back from giving him knowledge. وكان عبيد الله ابن عبد الله ابن 
Utbah yulatifu lahu fi su'ali fayu'izzuhu bil ilmi izza. As for another, you used to be so nice to him, right? When asking questions, they used to honor him with knowledge. Number nine, my brothers and my sisters. Number nine. We're nearly done, brothers and sisters. I'm very, very happy. I managed to do nine. I've still got another seven, eight minutes, inshallah ta'ala. Musa alayhi salatu wa was sent to who? In Israel, right? Um, as he was teaching them, guiding them, directing them, right? He chose to go and travel over staying with them. And I think this is very, very important, my brothers and my sisters. Sometimes what happens is you pick up a lot of publicity. Everyone's singing your name. You become big in the da'wah scene or you become somewhat big on TikTok. A satanic app where you pick up so many followers so quickly and people are listening you're giving a reminder every now and again right the opportunity presents itself now to go and study it might well be that you go abroad but then the shaitan is oh, all these people need you like you are some messenger that has been sent they need you oh, don't go you're benefiting everyone right he left giving da'wah to go and study. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors the individual who leaves something for the sake of Allah or who does something for the sake of Allah. This is why I really, really rate brothers. Right? I really rate brothers even though, mashallah, tabarakallah, they got da'wah pumping. And I told a couple of brothers this. Like one of those brothers, mashallah, I'll mention him. His name is Salab Dahad. Really commended him for this. He was teaching, getting a lot of publicity. People liked listening to him. Masjid would get full. And then he got accepted in Medina. Oh, it's hard, brothers and sisters. Hard. To leave all of that, Allah wa what will happen later on. He left everything to go and study. And I will guarantee you, my brothers and my sisters, you leave or you do that. When you come back, see how Allah Azza will honor you. Right? Don't let the shaitan get to you just because of a bit of publicity that you picked up. What was number nine? I think you guys are getting tired now. Huh. He left Bani Israel that he was giving da'wah to in order to go and seek knowledge. Tazawud min al-ilm. Number ten, my brothers and my sisters. Right? The ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches an individual is of two types. A type of knowledge that you can acquire with hard work. And there's a type of knowledge that is what ladunni. يَهَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ لِمَنْ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla gives it to whoever he wills. What's my evidence for is? وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا You might have all of that hard work. You might read a lot. Right? However, understanding is granted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? There are people, my brothers and my sisters, they have right, the zeal and the energy to memorize. They put in the time. But it just doesn't seem to be happening for them. So you need to beg Allah, Ya Allah, allow me to memorize. Ya Allah, allow me to understand this. Shaykh Al-Islam and Taymi, rahmatullahi alayhi, my brothers and my sisters, at times he would struggle to understand certain things. And Ibn Al-Qayyim says, وَشَهِدْتُ شَيْخِ الْإِسْلَامِ قَدَّسَ اللَّهُ رُوحَهُ إِذَا أَعْيَتْهُ الْمَسَائِلُ وَاسْتَصْعَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ فَرَّ مِنْهَا إِلَى التَّوْبَةِ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ I witnessed Ibn Taymiyyah at times when he would go through difficulty understanding certain issues, right? He just couldn't understand. He would run to Allah Azza wa Jal to make tawbah and to ask Allah for forgiveness. Jazakallah khair. And he would seek, right, Ease from Allah Jalla fi ula to remove this difficulty from him. You go straight to Allah Azza wa Jal. Shaykh Hussam Taymiyyah says, Man ishtahada wa sta'ana billah. Whoever works hard and he seeks aid and assistance from Allah. Wa al istighfar. And he keeps asking Allah for forgiveness. Wa ishtihada. And he works hard. Fala buddha yu'tiya Allah Azza wa Jalla min fadlih. Ma lam yakhtur bibal. It is a must that Allah gives him. That which the mind can't imagine. But you have to have, my brothers and my sisters, a period, right, of your day and perhaps even the last third of the night, Ya Allah, I am miskeen, right? Ya Allah, help me. 
make me understand this, grant me beneficial knowledge, and you will see doors opening up, my brothers and my sisters, that the mind couldn't imagine. I would have loved to talk about Ma'u Zamzam as well and how this can, you know, open up doors. Number 11, my brothers and my sisters. Being patient with the toughness and the roughness of the one who's teaching you. And at times he might even be rude. Right? What did Khadr alayhi sallat, I really like this benefit, right? What did Khadr alayhi sallat was some say to Musa, فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ Don't ask me anything. Imagine somebody said that to you. Imagine someone told you to shut up. Huh? I'm not going to say that Khadr told him to shut up. No, he didn't. But imagine someone did. In other words, right? He told him, listen, don't ask me anything. Shh, keep quiet. <laughs> up until I explain to you. Right? Well, I brothers and sisters, I'm going to quickly share something with you guys, right? When I went to Medina, I heard about the most deadliest memorizing circles ever in the whole Arabian Peninsula. They make you read a hadith backwards. And you, let's just say you have a poem, right? And the poem is 30 lines. You have to go 30, 29, 28. It tells you jump five, come back four, go three, up until you, huh? It was hard, but that really solidifies. So I went up to the sheikh who runs it. And at the time, I'm, I'm just being honest with you guys. I gave off the impression as if I was deserving to be in his halaqah. And he picked up on that. I was like, Sheikh, I did this and I did that. You know, can I come? I'll be able to hack it. Don't worry, Sheikh. It's like, yeah? All right. Wallahi, brother, says he made me cry. Absolutely humiliated me in front of little kids. Right. He goes, go memorize 150 hadith from Burugh Maram and then come back to me. So I did that, I came back, I was like, yeah, now he's going to let me in. I was like, okay, come sit down. He brings maybe an 11-year-old, he goes, test him. He wants to see that, as to, whether, <laughs> as to whether you're going to let your ego get in the way. He was like, test him. I'm expecting, oh, he's going to test my memory, or what the hadith, say it. How many times has Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrated a hadith in these 150? Like, Sheikh, I didn't come here for this. Like, I thought he was going to test the memorization. He goes, get out of here. <laughs> come back next day. Wallahi, humiliation. Till I actually cried, brothers and sisters, in front of the people. Some random guy started speaking from his ex-students. He was like, Akhi, you're not fit for this. Akhi, get out of here. Imagine his student saying this to me. But Wallahi, brothers and sisters, whenever I see him now, I'll go kiss him on the forehead. Right? I go kiss him on the forehead even though he's the only sheikh in Medina that ever humiliated me. Why? Because he taught me something that no one else did. He taught me how to solidify a hadith when memorizing it. Even though now my memory has become weak because you get busy. But at the time, right, we would read like 200 hadith brrr, like that. You make a single mistake, you got to restart again. At time. So that's something, well, he actually taught me how to solidify. That's something that I took from him that no one else taught me. Maybe Sheikh Bukhari will tell us whether in Mauritania they do it better. Because they are the people of memorization in Mauritania. Araft. So you have to be patient, brothers and sisters. The poet, he says, وَمَن لَمْ يَصْبِرْ عَلَىٰ ذُلِّ التَّعَلُّمِ سَاعَةً تَجَرَّعَ كَأْسَ الْجَهْلِ طُولَ حَيَاتِ Whoever is not patient for an hour, he will drink ignorance for the rest of his life. Wallahi, I used to walk with the sheikh in the haram. People would give him dirty looks. Because why are you with him? Akhi, there's so many teachers. Go to them. Why are you with him for? And I'm like, yeah. Why am I with him? Later on, I understood why. And these guys that were giving him dirty looks, are, you know, one of those looks, they would walk away and are people who he humiliated or he refused into his halaqa who weren't patient. Uh, Allah yahfadu. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Shaydan, he's the one that reads on Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al Abad. Well, has been reading upon him for the last 10 years. The guy that you might hear in the lessons is him. And if you're not patient, my brothers, you're going to miss out a lot. So bear that in mind when the Sheikh is tough with you. He has something that you really need. So be patient. Right?
Number 12, my brothers and my sisters, and I mentioned this earlier, a big cause of being able to remain patient is to have an idea of what you're getting yourself involved in. Without even asking, right? Without even asking, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said, don't worry, I'm going to be patient. Satajiduni insha'Allah sabira. You're going to find me patient, don't worry. I'll be with you. I said to him, Tasbiru ala ma lam tuhid bi khubra. How can you be patient about something that you have no idea about? Right? It will make it so much more easy for you. I'm nearly done, Shaykh. Normally when they walk around, they're trying to tell you something. Huh? Are you brother and sister with me? Right? When it comes to marriage, when it comes to investment, you have to prepare yourself mentally that marriage is not going to be all rosy. How many times do we find marriage? First month, oh, I think it's time to jump ship. The grass is green on the other side. I never signed up for this. I had my single life. I was enjoying myself. And this guy's uneducated about marriage. You have to tell your, there's not. I remember my dad one time said to me, listen, there's not a single house that is free of problems. Is he wrong, brothers and sisters? There's always going to be arguments. Huh? So have that. When you prepare, oh, now, okay, it's happening. What my dad said. What I took in the marriage course. Huh? Me and Sheikh Muhammad Ali done. We told them everything. We scared the living daylight out of them. Right? Just to give them what the heads up. Likewise, investments. Even Medina. Brothers who go to Medina, they say Britain has the biggest dropout rate from Medina. And I think you know why? Uh, you know why? When we go for Umrah, where do we stay? We stay in the Hilton, we stay in Zamzam, we stay in these big hotels, clock tower. You think, oh, it's going to the Haram in and out. That's what life in Mecca and Medina is. It's a very different story when you actually go there to study. Shaykh, I'm nearly done, huh? Yeah. So have some insight, ask. Likewise, when you make an investment, ask. Be ready that you could end up losing everything. Are you going to be able to patient? Be patient if you lose everything. Number 13, my brothers and my sisters. The rest are very quick anyway, inshallah. Following the footsteps of Musa. By it, my brothers and my sisters, you will attain al-jannah. You know, Sheikh Abshir, Sheikh did this. Huh? Sheikh, these are like literally less than two minutes. Less than two minutes. They're very quickly. You know, you can acquire Jannah through zakat, through sadaqah, through fasting, through praying. There are different doors to al-Jannah. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, he, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told us, Man tariqan fiya masahal, Allah bi tariqan jannah. Whoever takes a path and seeks not Allah will make his path to al-Jannah. A lot easier. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha ghayru, my brothers and my sisters. This will bring you utter joy and happiness. Right? I receive on average maybe a hundred messages either by email, Instagram, and Twitter every day. Problems after problems after problems. And at times I say to myself, well, the solution to all of this is if we just studied a little bit. Many people think that when you start seeking knowledge, this is like a profession, a career path, right? And I only want to, or I only should seek knowledge if I'm trying to become the next big mufti. Right? People choose engineering, they choose medicine, they choose mathematics. right? And they look at seeking knowledge the same way. It's not like that, my brothers and sisters. We can't function in this world. We can't navigate around the fitna to shubuhat and the fitna to shabat except with beneficial knowledge. You need knowledge no matter who you are, whether you're a doctor or a multimillionaire. Otherwise, you may well find yourself in depression and joining that long list of people who are messaging and saying, brother, help me. Brothers with blue ticks are messaging me on Instagram who are rappers, some even footballers. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm saying, brother, I feel this, you know, emptiness. What can I do? Right? Number 14, my brothers and my sisters. Allah Azza wa Jal referred to those who were working on the ship. Right? They would work on sea, right? As miskin. Someone might still be, right? Eligible for zakah, because Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, right? In Masadaqatu lil Fukarai wal Masakin wal Amilin, Aleha wal From amongst those eight that were mentioned are Masakin. He may have something that helps him get by, but it's still not enough and he's eligible for a zakah. Right? So don't judge a book by its cover. You don't know what they're going through. Right? Oh, this guy has got this, then khalas, he must be alright. No. 
Number 15, my brothers and my sisters. There is a big qaida, just how, how we learned a qaida earlier. Amal al insani fi mali ghayri idha kana ala wajh al maslahati wa izalat al mafsalit anno yajuz. Walau bila idhnin. Right? Dealing or doing something that, right? Let me rephrase this right. Let me give you guys an example to make it easier. Let's just say there is three, four people who have invested into a company. One of them makes a move because he fears that all of the money will be lost. He makes a particular decision. He saves it, but there is a small loss. The other three investors, are they allowed to turn around and say, Akhi, it's your fault that we made this loss? No, he was protecting the wealth, so he had to take that decision. So sometimes you can do something with the wealth of others in order to protect. What's my evidence? What he did. He put a hole in the ship which protected the rest of the ship from being taken away from, taken away by that tyrannical, oppressive ruler. That is benefit number 15, my brothers and my sisters. 16 is that if Allah Azza wa Jal, if you do something out of forgetfulness, you can't hold him to account. Allah doesn't hold him to account. The first one was out of forgetfulness, right? Some people, because he's done something out of forgetfulness, they hold it for the next 10 years. And he's telling you, I don't know how to forget from us. And last but not least, number 17, saying, Insha'Allah, and that's exactly what he done, my brothers and my sisters, Inni fa'ilun, or Insha'Allah, satajimi, Insha'Allah, wasabira. Perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will protect you from some misfortune. Jazakum Allah khairan, wa ahsan Allah ilaykum. We did more than what we wanted to go through. We done 17. Tilka sab'atu ashara tin kamila. Right? May Allah bless you all. Jazakum Allah khairan.